Cell mediated immunity is involved specifically in protection against intracellular pathogens, intracellular bacteria, viruses, and also cancer and tumors. Cell mediated immunity is mostly associated with T cells, NK cells, and activated phagocytes. Kind of an overview of how this branch works we have naive T cells that are activated in the lymph nodes via dendritic cells or other APCs presenting the cognate antigen. Remember that the T cells have to see this antigen or this peptide presented in the context of MHC in order to respond. If it's specific and if they have the right MHC, then they become mature T cells and they will go into the circulation. The APCs will then present the same antigen to the T cells in the periphery. And at that point, we get clonal expansion of effector cells, either via MHC class 1, which is enhancing and activating CD8 CT CTLs, which would lead to direct cytotoxicity of cells, or via MHC class 2, which will activate CD4 T helper cells and lead to cytokine secretion. Once we have activation and expansion, the source of antigen is eliminated, and the effector T cells will die. The memory T cells that are created will survive. Starting from the very beginning, remember that these immature T cells are kind of born through the pluripotent stem cells, the hematopoietic stem cells in the bone marrow. Before they mature, they leave the bone marrow as immature T cells and migrate into the thymus. Now, the thymus secretes thymopoietines 1 and 2 to promote differentiation of lymphocytes into T cells. Also, it's important to note that this thymus atrophies after puberty. So, Babies, if you look at their chest x-rays, you see something that's going on above the heart, a big shadow. That's the thymus. However, as they get older and as they progress to the point of puberty, this thymus goes shrinking smaller and smaller and smaller. Even though it shrinks, it can still direct T-cell genesis in the lymph nodes. So while these T-cells are in the thymus, their maturation will begin in the outer cortex. In the outer cortex, they differentiate to express CD3 in both CD4 and CD8. And at this point, they're known as double positive thymocytes. So these initial immature T cells entering the thymus will begin to express CD3, CD4, and CD8. Then they will acquire specific T cell receptors and commit to single antigen specificity. Like the B cells, these cells will make T cell receptors that will allow them to focus in on a single specific antigen. So in addition to gaining a TCR, we also have to test this TCR. We have to educate the T cells in order to make sure that they respond appropriately. This happens in the medulla of the thymus. And the process goes so that the TCRs are exposed to MHC molecules loaded with self-peptides. TCRs that bind strongly are self-reactive and receive apoptotic signals. This is called negative selection. TCRs that bind with low avidity receive growth signals, positive selection. TCRs that don't bind at all die from the lack of signals. So again, through positive and negative selection, which we've discussed earlier, with the positive selection, we weed out the cells that don't bind at all. We want those TCRs that bind with low avidity. The TCRs that don't bind at all die from neglect. The TCRs that are binding too strongly will receive apoptotic signals because we don't want the T cells binding too strongly to the MHC. That could lead to autoimmunity. We want those middle of the road T cells, low avidity, those are the ones that survive. Those are the ones that receive the growth signals. Those are the ones that are educated, so to speak, and graduate thymic education. So as the double positive thymocytes, remember at this point they're still expressing CD4 and CD8. As they mature in the medulla and are undergoing this positive and negative selection, some TCRs will bind with higher affinity to MHC1 and others to MHC2. Those that bind with higher affinity to MHC class 1 will mature into CD8 T cells. Those that bind with a higher affinity to MHC class 2 will mature into CD4 T cells. Once they've matured, now we've tested them, we've made sure that they're the middle of the road T cell receptors, and we've decided which ones they like better, MHC1 or MHC2, and so we've determined whether they're going to be CD8s or CD4s, then they can now leave the thymus as naive T cells 
and migrate to lymph nodes. Now, T cell activation is a two-step process. It requires two signals. It's another level of control, going back to the idea that if these cells are the generals behind the entire immune response, you really want to keep them in check. You want to make sure that they only get activated when you want them activated. Otherwise, they could run amok. They could cause all kinds of problems. So we have a two-signal theory. Signal one is the one that we've been talking about. When T cells are activated by APCs, the first signal that they have to receive is that signal that's coming through the MHC complex. So it's the MHC that's holding the peptide, hooks up with the TCR-CD3 complex, and we look for that match. Is the peptide specific, and is it the right MHC? That's the first signal that has to come through. Signal two is an interaction of APC co-stimulatory molecules with receptors on the T cell, specifically CD28 receptors on the surface of the T cells, and B7, or CD80, or CD86 molecules on the APCs. We include all of the nomenclature in there because they're both still used. B7 is an older nomenclature. The new nomenclature says that it's either CD80 or CD86. So one of those molecules expressed on the APC has to come in contact with the CD28 molecule expressed on the T cell, and that's the second signal. And only when we get both of those signals will the T cell become activated. Then, interestingly, the CD4 T helper cell can bidirectionally co-stimulate the APC. If it's a macrophage or a B cell, the T cell can actually send signals back to the APC to activate it. And we do this through another surface receptor called CD40 ligand on the T cell that binds to CD40 on the surface of the APC. So if you want to see a picture of this, here's the whole process, kind of what we just described here. We have a T helper cell, a naive T helper cell, being presented antigen by this B cell. Don't worry about the Th2 at this point. We'll talk about that in a little while. We have the B cell. It's processed this antigen, and now it's presenting a piece of it in class 2 MHC here on the surface. The class 2 MHC and the TCR have to bind together. The TCR is looking at that specificity. That's signal 1. The other part of signal 1 is the CD4 coming over and recognizing that this is a class 2 MHC molecule. That's all part of signal 1. That has to happen in order for the T cell to become activated. The other thing that has to happen is this interaction that's right above that, the CD28 and the CD80. That interaction is signal number 2. That's called the co-stimulatory molecule interaction. Both of those have to take place in order for this T cell to become activated. Now, once this T helper cell becomes activated, it's going to upregulate certain genes. It's going to upregulate cytokine genes. It's going to upregulate surface receptors as well. One of those surface receptors is CD40 ligand. The CD40 ligand from the T helper cell will then bind to the CD40 that's being expressed on the surface of the B cell. That bidirectionally stimulates what we just talked about, bidirectionally stimulates the B cell to now become active. That B cell will then, in turn, upregulate cytokine receptors on its surface. Those receptors can then bind to the cytokines that the T helper cell is making. In this case, because it's a Th2 cell, it's making cytokines IL-4, IL-5, and IL-6. So those cytokines will then bind to the cytokine receptors on the B cell, and that promotes the B cell differentiation and activation that we talked about. That promotes the somatic hypermutation. That promotes the class switching. That promotes the memory cell response. So once the cytokines get involved, now that B cell starts to clonally expand, starts to make memory cells, starts to make plasma cells, and it starts to class switch so that as it continues to expand, it won't make IgM plasma cells, but will make IgG or IgA plasma cells, for example. So again, kind of going through step by step for that last slide, just to make sure we're all clear. MHC class 2 and the peptide interact with the TCR complex on the CD4 T cell. That's signal 1. CD80 or 86 binds to CD28. That's signal 2. These interactions activate that T helper cell, which then upregulates certain genes. The CD40 ligand on the T cell interacts with the CD40 on the B cell. That helps the B cell upregulate cytokine receptors. Also, the CD4 T cell makes and secretes cytokines. In this case, it's Th2 cytokines, IL-4, IL-5, and IL-6. These cytokines lead to the activation and proliferation of the B cell and are required for different processes in the B cell, such as somatic hypermutation, class switching, and memory and plasma cell differentiation.